So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session on Western Asia Minor. My name is Eberhard Zenger. I'm one of three co-hosts. The other one, um, Ivo Heinal, who will be speak after me, and Jorrit Kelder, who will do some of the moderation of the talks. Um, I wanted to start out with an introduction for those people who may just drop by because they are curious to find out more about Western Asia Minor during the Middle and the Late Bronze Age, and that's why I wanted to um, give you a short general introduction at the beginning before we dive into the real scientific subjects. So, what we call now Luvians, um, who are they and who were their contemporaries in Western Asia Minor? Before I start, I want to show you a huge thank you to the speakers who all of them came from very far away um, to make it possible to make their contributions here in archaeology, coming right from the field, some of them, um, and in linguistics, um, so that we get a broad spectrum of uh, the civilization and what we know about it so far. So we are dealing with the Eastern Mediterranean and with the Anatolian subcontinent, in particular with the west of it, as you can see in this exaggerated topographic image. It is a very complex landscape, and because of that, um, the states that existed in this area were for the most part rather small. Um, it's quite similar to Switzerland, even though the elevations are, of course, not the same. Um, and uh, there's a gap in our knowledge regarding this area as far as the Middle Bronze Age is concerned, the Middle and Late Bronze Age, the second millennium BC. And if you would ask me, I would say this is due to the research history. If we look at uh, the textbooks that are available today, the big um, proceedings of conferences, and it turns out that there have been a number of big books on Aegean Bronze Age in the past uh, years. These altogether comprise about 3,000 pages, but not 20 pages in those 3,000 pages speak about Western Asia Minor during the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Why is this so? In particular, if you look at the natural resources, this is um, a map of the gold, silver, copper, and lead deposits. And if we introduce the known cultures, the Mycenaeans and the Hittites, it turns out that the area in Western Asia Minor is very rich in ore deposits. But uh, we, have, we do not attribute a civilization or a culture to it. And I think personally that this is due to the research history um, that began with uh, Frank Calvert excavating there in the 1860s and then Heinrich Schliemann taking over in a big way in um, 1870, opening up a new world, basically, the, uh, the Bronze Age societies, which were thus far not really known or investigated. And it continued then, Schliemann continued to work uh, on, in southern Greece, in Mycenae, in Tyrans, and Orchomenos in the 1980s, and in 1899, the Ottoman uh, control of Crete was discontinued, and as a consequence, a number of archaeologists moved in and started excavations there, in particular Arthur Evans and Knossos in 1900. And then eventually in 1907, German investigations began at Hattusha. And the person who summarized this knowledge on the Aegean Bronze Age that was accumulated in all these archaeological projects was basically Arthur Evans with his publications of the Palace of uh, Minos 
in, uh, from 1920 onwards. And of course, he attributed one civilization to the Minoans, which were of primary importance for him, one to the Mycenaeans, and he had another one, and that's the Cycladic culture uh, on the Aegean Islands. And if one looks at the boundary between Europe and um, Turkey, it turns out that these fall neatly into European territory. This was the time of the independence war between Greece and Turkey, and we know of um, Arthur Evans that he was very Eurocentric in his views. Because of the many documents that were found in Hattusha and the, so much architecture, of course the Hittite uh, culture was added to the picture soon thereafter, but this gap continued for 100 years. And what we are trying to do now for the past five years is to put more emphasis on this and uh, encourage researchers to pay attention to this area. And to make it simpler to talk about it, um, I suggested to call it Luvian because Luvian was the language that was predominantly spoken in this area, as we can see in this map. Hittite was limited to central Anatolia, and even there it was limited to the higher echelons of the society. Um, uh, the, the rest, many of them spoke Luvian, different kinds of languages as well. This is something that linguists have been aware of for a long time, so there is a lot of research on Luvian uh, linguistics over um, the past 50 years, essentially. So we have a, a gap now in knowledge between the linguists and, and the archaeologists. And um, it would be good to close this gap, and I'm happy to say that there will be a number of presentations today, this morning, uh, from the field to describe what's going on in archaeology. So we start out with the roots. Ivo, Ivo Heinal will speak right after me about this. Basically, uh, Luvian is an Indo-European language like Hittite, and um, it came from the, the people who brought it into Anatolia, came from um, north of the Black Sea. And the question is when exactly, and did they come through the Balkan, or did they come from the east, or both maybe. But uh, we will hear much more about that. Then we go on to talk about field work. We catalogued over 400 ar uh, archaeological sites. They are often Hyux or Tels, or Magulas in Greek, um, up to 500 meters in diameter. Some are even bigger than that up to 25 meters tall with stratified anthropogenic deposits stretching back 5,000 years in history. And they have in common that they are not investigated. So places could have looked like this with a central citadel and then a lower town around them was one example of a good excavation of such a pretty much purely Luvian or Western Anatolian settlement at Chine Tepecik by Seven Schünel, where you can even see the fortification towers. We will then look at the settlement pattern, two presentations by um, Alpa and Sefa. Um, basically, this is the distribution of the settlements in Western Asia Minor. We can distinguish minor and major ones uh, and those that have been excavated. There have been about uh, two dozen archaeological projects by Turkish archaeologists in the past uh, 20 or 30 years. And now we can attribute um, also states, state names to these areas. Fred Wauthausen will talk about that. Material culture, unfortunately we have no presentations on that, which is also part to the um, to the research gap. These are some so-called, well, thus far considered Hittite um, artifacts, but of course when the Hittites came to Anatolia there were traditions there for many hundred years and, and these items basically reflect those traditions, for instance the possessions here, or they even contain um, Luvian captions like here the Schimmel writing. And then there are also pots from excavations by Turkish archaeologists, like this one, where you can see the from Badam Gedi, um, where you can see that uh, the warriors have funny headdresses, 
um, those occur in a number of places and might be characteristic for the warriors in Western Asia Minor. Here, for instance, is the Mycenaean warrior race, the famous one excavated, uh, found by Schliemann um, at Mycenae. And this is the back side where you get the, the same kind of headdresses again. Um, then, of course, much emphasis will be put on interpretation of scripts by Alvin Klöckhorst, Willemine Wahl, and Francis Breyer. Is he here yet? I have not seen him yet. Um, we'll see. Um, just very briefly, Luvian was written in uh, Arcadian cuneiform, uh, but it was also written in Luvian hieroglyphic. Here, the famous inscription from the Südburg by Shupilulu Yuma II, and the drawing is uh, 4 meters wide and 1.8 meters tall. And here, a reconstruction of the Latmos, um, the basin with the inscription around it. And this continued for 1400 years up until 600 BC. This is one of the many inscriptions we have from the early Iron Age in Carchemish. And then there are a number of sealed stones where we have Luvian hieroglyphs sometimes combined. Um, uh, seals with, uh, with cuneiform and eventually Fred Wauthausen will talk about political geography. This is a map that is, uh, occurs in a number of textbooks uh, for the late Bronze Age in Western Asia Minor but if you continue the story towards the end of the 13th century uh, it turns out that the West for instance became independent uh, and then the north became more powerful, and so did the west. And so what happened, and then in, in the east, uh, Isuva, the, the famous uh, copper mines, were lost at the time. Um, and so the, the Hittite kingdom shrunk more and more. And this is pretty much the situation around 1200. BC as we know it. And now we can attribute um, place names to this so we have a much better understanding of the political geography and most of you will know that I personally think that these uh, Western Anatolian states contributed to the demise of the Hittite Empire uh, um, and took part in the Sea People Raids um, at around 1190 BC. So that was my general overview for those um, who hear about this for the first time. And with this, um, I just want to say that this uh, session today is uh, supported by Luvian Studies. Um, and uh, we are very happy to be able to, um, to help the researchers in the project projects and if you are interested in this kind of research please get in touch with us. Uh, our purpose is to help you conduct your, your work. Thank, thank you very much.